Philippians chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Where is Paul when he is penning these words? He's on a vacation at the Bahamas. He's in prison. Rejoice in the Lord always. What does always mean? Yeah. Even when there's a fire lapping at your backyard? That's right. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for, say with me, nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Don't know why I've got this peace, but I do. Will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let's go ahead with our first slide. We're going to have lots of slides tonight. I hope you have fun with this. We're going to talk a little bit about these guys. This was the Republican National Convention this year. No, it really wasn't. This is, uh, of course, that beautiful painting by Jean Leon Ferris. He, he um, painted this in 1912. Hangs in the Library of Congress. What a beautiful, beautiful painting. Well, of course, this is uh, kind of commemorating the first sort of... Um, there were earlier Thanksgiving proclamations in various communities. Ten years in front of when the pilgrims landed... Um, there was another English settlement at Jamestown. It's in Virginia, about 550 miles to the south. But they were having a really hard time. It was a whole different ball game. Really, what they were about was finding gold. And because they came across with that gentrification sort of strata, we have the lords, and then you have the sub, and then the sub, and then the slave, and then the, the indentured servant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so they poured out on the Virginia soil there, and not really so much to start a society, really. What they wanted to do was find gold. And it went very badly for Jamestown. By the time the pilgrims were loading up there in Southampton, in uh, what is uh, England, what is today the UK, um, there were terrible reports coming from the American coast. Nine out of every ten of those that went to Jamestown died. And the, the indigenous people there, the Native Americans, in many cases, they were forced to react strongly to any of the boats and ships coming across because by the year 1620, um, fur traders and slave traders had done such a poor job. Well, it was abominable in many respects. They, they tricked Indians aboard their, their vessels only to slap them in irons and take them as slaves and sell them. Then, of course, you know about the diseases, measles and smallpox and many of those diseases that wiped out entire tribes. Can you blame the, Americans, or the, the Native Americans for being a little twitchy when it came to the white folks? So by the time that the pilgrims boarded the Mayflower, they were pretty, uh, well, it was a pretty dire situation. Well, who were the pilgrims? The pilgrims were a group of people that some have called the Puritans, some have called the, the um, Separatists, some have called them the Brownists. Really what's happening is, is in England, King Henry VIII, that, Ken, King Henry VIII I am, I am, if you know that song, uh, <laughs> He uh, wanted to divorce his wife, uh, who they were married in a Catholic ceremony, because he had the hots for Anne Boleyn. And so he goes to, the, uh, goes to the Pope, and he says, well, can you annul my marriage so I can go out after this hottie Anne Boleyn? The Pope said, I don't think so, because you happen to be married to the daughter of the King of Spain. And uh, he had a bit of the Reformation uh, taking hold in Europe at that time. And so there were a lot of... Um, there were a lot of um, Protestant denominations and groups that were growing. So Spain was squarely Roman Catholic, so he wasn't going to, you know, hack and cheese off the, the king. No, he says. So King Henry VIII, I am, I am, I am. He says, well, fine, then I'll start my own religion. And he starts the, the Church of England. And the Church of England, if you look from the outside looking in, it has a lot of the same trappings as the Roman Catholic Church, but they were different. And, of course, 
the Pope would be the head of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, who, church, who do you suppose was head of the, the Church of England Church? King Henry VIII, I am, I am. That's who he was. So by the time you get down to the early 1600s, um, that was the church of choice there in England, the Church of England. And they forbade you to have a Bible study in your own home. You're not trained. You'd have been to the right seminary schooling and such. No way. You can't be trusted with God's word. And so there were sort of officials that would roam some of the streets and they would peer in the windows. And if you happen to be holding a Bible study or have a Bible open in your lap, you could be arrested. There were other problems and issues. So there were some brothers and sisters of yours 400 years ago, November the 21st, 400 years ago, they said, well, we could go with the flow because that's what the largest churches were doing. If you wanted to have fun and fit in, well, then go to those churches. There was plenty of social networking going on. But not these brothers and sisters of yours. They said, nope, we're going to read our Bibles. We're going to study. They had a wonderful translation called the Geneva Bible that had actual study notes in the margins. And they were learning their Bibles. But they were under tremendous persecution, as you know. So they split for a while. and They, they, they headed off to Holland. And uh, that didn't really work out very well. And they really figured out there's only one place we can go. We have to go to America. But remember what's been happening in America. The Native Americans rising up and slaughtering entire crews of vessels. Hostile Native Americans pretty much from the southern tip of Florida, the Seminoles, all the way up to, to, uh, to the north Maine in Nova Scotia. It's pretty rough going. So they put together uh, some finances and they had to take on with them what, are, what were called later merchant adventurers. They had kind of a nickname called the Strangers. So of the 102 people that were on the Mayflower, plus their 30 crew members, not all of them were Puritans. There were some people that were there because they wanted a, a business of working with the pilgrims once they landed. So the pilgrims actually, they booked two vessels, the Speedwell and the Mayflower. And the Speedwell was probably not doing too well. And later scholarship seems to prove that the crew of the Speedwell thought it was an ill-fated venture. So they loaded on more sails, so to speak. They overburdened the, the main mass with too much silk, too much sail, and worked loose. Um, those big old pillars or those masts were, of course, anchored uh, near the bottom of the vessel and was working loose. So they turned around, they had to come back, and they patched it up. And the Speedwell and the Mayflower took off again. And again, they probably put on too much sail. The workings worked loose once again. And then they finally had to come back that second time. This is not an auspicious beginning. So they said, maybe God doesn't want us to take the Speedwell. So the pilgrims and the merchant adventurers, uh, 30 were on the Speedwell, 90 on the Mayflower. They had to turn back twice. They began in August the 4th, which would have given them plenty of time to arrive in the New World and get their 19 houses built plus two common houses. And then a palisade around the whole situation so, of course, they could defend themselves. By the time after those two false starts, they unload the speed well and then they pack the Mayflower. The Mayflower looked a little bit like this. Go ahead. This is called the Mayflower too. If you've ever been to the East Coast, you can go and visit this. It's, it's moored uh, somewhere near, I think, the Plymouth Plantation. That is an actual replica based on maritime records of ships and vessels that were very similar to the Mayflower. So it was built in 1955 and 1956. Pretty cool vessel. And they sailed it uh, from Southampton all the way across the Atlantic and landed in Plymouth. I'll go to the next slide. Here's another shot of it. Looks pretty cool, huh? There it is. You can see the scale of the humans. Um, it's 106 feet long, and it's 25 feet, 26 feet wide. I hit the go button. There's an arrow. You, you see where that arrow is pointing? There's some humans standing there. Well, that's the main deck. And then under their feet is what was called a, a layer or a deck called the tween deck. 
And the small children and the, and the young women, uh, Captain Smith said, you can use my, um, my quarters and you can see that sort of under that, that cutaway on the right-hand side, uh, which was a bit of a, a perch or a place where the captain could look out. So that's where they were able to stay, which was pretty good. And then the captain bunked in with the crew. Where were the rest of the people? They were underneath where those people are standing in the tween decks. A hundred and two humans and all of their cargo. You want to see? It's actually more spacious than you might think. Go ahead. It looks like this. Yeah, pretty good. No, that's, that's not it at all. <laughs> Here's what it really looks like. Go ahead. There you go. It's basically the size of a volleyball court, the dimensions, width and length. And if you go to the, to the Mayflower 2, I've never been there, but I sure would like to get there one day. The, the, uh, those beams are a little lower than six feet. Only six feet tall. Pretty amazing. And that's where they were. Go ahead to our next slide. Uh, somebody made a model of it. That's what it looked like. That's a cutaway version. Uh, hit your go button. Oh, there's a, there's a close-up. You can see where a lot of the uh, casks were, were maintained. Uh, they didn't have tanks as we know them, so you needed some uh, watertight, uh, liquid-proof um, casks. And there was a young 20-year-old young man named John Alden who was hired by the captain to look after those casks. He was part of the crew. There's a wonderful love story of John Alden once they reach Plymouth after that first winter when half of them died. There was a 17-year-old girl by the name of Priscilla Mullins. She was uh, from the, uh, the, um, the stranger group. Her dad died in that first winter. Her mom died in that first winter. And her 12-year-old brother, Joseph, died. And they were not Puritans. Can you imagine a 17-year-old having lost her entire family? There's a wonderful story of a a Puritan gal, she was being fostered by two other uh, uh, pilgrims, and her name was Desire Minter, and she was also about 17 years of age. Well, there were a lot of very difficult stories about that first winter, but there is a bright spot. Priscilla Mullins and John Alden, they fall in love, and they are married, and they have, I believe it is, 14 children. Anyway, hit the go button again. There's a circle. Um, there's your tween decks. A hundred people all packed in with whatever they could pack in. Because remember, they started out with two ships and they had to combine. So when they got to rolling, when they got started, of course, most of the Puritans and even the strangers, they weren't sea people. And so if you go out on a boat and you're not used to it, what usually kind of starts happening? You get seasick. And then something else happened, because as soon as they got out, when they finally did launch, it was many months later, they didn't get out of there until finally September the 6th. So now the North Atlantic, the storms are showing up. And that little boat, if you had a chance to kind of look at it, it has a very pronounced flat sort of bottom end to it. And because the storms were driving with such force, you couldn't really put out a lot of sail because you could damage your, your rigging. So with very little sail to propel them forward, they really didn't go very fast at all. If you have a powered vessel and the waves are coming, you're taught to go 90 degrees into the waves. The Mayflower did not have that luxury, so she sort of roiled to the one side and would sort of just do this at the bottom of every trough. Um, the governor, um, who... Um, uh, William Bradford, who wrote about this, and he wrote about it in a book called On Plymouth Plantation, he talks about that, that he estimated that oftentimes the Mayflower would heal up to 45 degrees every time on either side. So you, got, you don't have your, your sea legs in the first place, and because of the storm, they had to batten down the hatches to keep the under workings uh, airtight. So that means no fire, and that means no cooking, so to eat, of course, they had to go into their stores of fruits and some grains. Let me rephrase that for you. High fiber. So between feeling so awful and, and 
spewing, as they would say, they developed something called the, the scours. Yeah, both ends were going. Now, you might look at that model. You may see a table and some casks and some ladders and such. Do you see a little boy's room and a little girl's room? That's because it wasn't there. How did they do that? You would rig up two sheets as best you could in certain areas, and then you had to relieve yourself in the wash pot. Let me rephrase that. You had to be a very good aim. Imagine 66 days inside the tween decks with all of those sick people and the smell. That's astounding to me. There, there was a sailor who took particular glee in the miserable condition of the Puritans, and he called them psalm singing puke stockings. <laughs> and he, as they were so sick, and he would yell down through the hold all manner of sort of derogatory, and he would take great delight, and he would threaten them, or he would, he would say, I can't wait to sew you in the shrouds and toss you overboard for fish food. So when you died on board, they would sew you in a sheet of sorts, and then over you'd go. And he laughed, oh, you're never going to make it. And it was a lot, of the, a lot of the Puritans were losing heart, so what would they do? They prayed, oh, Lord, this man is making it very difficult, especially for the children. The very next day, says William Bradford, this sailor developed a high fever for no apparent reason, and he died within 10 hours. And he was the first one sewed in the shroud and tossed over. Bradford did say, after that, strangely, none of the crew ever bothered the pilgrims again. True story. You can see the casks underneath. Here was another issue. There were two precocious young men that were not, they were not of, a, of a pilgrim family. That was John Billington, 16, and his brother Francis Billington. And what do teenagers do when they're bored? Well, they play around in areas they shouldn't play in. Some of those casks were their gunpowder for when they arrived. They had to field a certain defense, of course. So what the Billington boys were doing is they were discovered underneath the tween decks, and they had found the quills, which is a kind of a flammable little element that you put on your musket. So when the quill was lit on your trigger, and then your powder was here, and then your musket was, was, had the... the uh, the charge already set up and packed, and then the, the ball itself, the quill was lit and it would smolder. So when you were ready to shoot, you pull the trigger and the quill would come forward and then ignite the gunpowder and fire the projectile out the end. That was the, the technology of the time. Well, the Billington boys found the box of quills and they were lighting them and throwing them across the top of the gunpowder and giggling as it uh, sparked on their clothing on the other side. That could have been the end of the Mayflower right there. Another thing happened too, you see the main mast because it, it goes through the deck and is anchored there at the bottom. You can see uh, this, whoever put this together was very exacting in detail. Do you see all the rocks along the bottom? Of course, that would be your ballast and you would have the heaviest parts of your cargo at the lowest part of the ship so that you wouldn't capsize. And so you can see the beam, especially as it goes up through the tween deck. One of the main cross members that held the main and the tallest uh, mass at the half point of the journey cracked and sagged at an, a very alarming angle. If it were to break completely, that means that the center mass would be loose and then you would be in real trouble. That's a ship that could very well sink uh, in the next large storm. So they were halfway across, what do we do? After everything, the speed well and all the problems and all the scours and all the seasickness. Your brothers and sisters, what they did was they joined hands and they began to pray and ask God, what should we do? And somebody remembers, wait a minute, Packed somewhere underneath the ship was Edward Wins Winslow's big printing press. 
And the big component of the printing press was this large metal screw that, of course, you would, when you were going to print, you, you'd make your movable type and you'd put it on this press and then you would screw this lever down and press the paper into the ink. Would it be large enough? So they took some timber that they had, they, they, they dug out Winslow's big printing press, they isolated the screw and they put it on the bottom and they winched up into the appropriate place that main beam there across. And they decided, well, let's just go for it. And they did. 66 days. Um, let me show you what happened. Go ahead and go, go to our next slide. This is how it was supposed to go. There's, of course, North America. Isn't it great that you can see the state lines from space? I think that's awesome. Pretty awesome. So here they come. Hit the go button. They were supposed to land here in Virginia. That's where their charter was for. So when they were to land there, then everyone who came aboard the ship, uh, um, Christopher Smith, the captain, uh, then you were, of course, beholden to, to belong to the charter, to behave yourself in an according manner. What happened was, because of all the storms, and they had left so late, they arrive November the 21st. And they assert their first sight land. Land ho! Can you imagine 66 days of being in the hold or the tween decks of that vessel? Would you be a little excited about land ho? But as they got closer, oops, hit the go button. They weren't there at all. They were 550 miles to the north. And that was Massachusetts Bay. And the land that they had seen was the was the little kick island, the little uh, island uh, where Providence, Provincetown is. Go ahead, let's zoom in. Go ahead. Here's Massachusetts Bay right there. Hit the go button. A little closer still, you see the, what looks like a finger that comes around. And then at the bottom, you see two islands. That's Nantucket and, of course, Martha's Vineyard. That's uh, where the rich and the famous play these days. But in those days, there wasn't much going on. Hit our go button again. There's Massachusetts. It wasn't Massachusetts then. It was largely a wild wilderness and home to many other Native American people. A funny thing happened once they arrived there. I'll hit the go button one more time. Here's Massachusetts Bay. And then go ahead. There is where when they came across, they got into a, a safe kind of harbor. It's one of the safest harbors there in the whole eastern coast. And when they realized that where they were, at first they said, well, if we get off the boat here, our charter is for Virginia. If we get off the boat here, disembark at this location, then legally speaking, sort of people could do whatever they wanted. So they didn't land. They moved to the lee side of um, Provincetown, that little hook of land right there. And then they prayed and they said, Lord, what do you want us to do? At first, I should say, before they did that, they tried to go to the south and get down to Virginia, but an unusual system of storms blew them back on this location. That's when they anchored on the lee side, and they said, this might be a God thing. So then they, they anchored not far from Provincetown, and then they fasted, and they prayed some more. You've been on the boat for 66 days. Can we please just get to a Motel 6, please? But they said, no, we got to take care of some stuff. So they came up with something called the Mayflower Compact. So basically stated, the Mayflower Compact said, if you work and you contribute, you can have a say in the governorship or the, the leading of your leaders. That was very, very unusual. Jamestown, 550 miles to the south, that wasn't the way at all. You were either a honcho or you were a slave, and there was nothing you can do about it. That's one of the reasons why the, the uh, royalty guys or the guys who were thinking they were really cool, they didn't do any work at all. And that's why they were dying nine out of every ten. The Mayflower Compact is basically in its infancy form of what we will eventually hear as some of the 20-some items mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. It's one of the seed foundational documents of democracy in America. Well, there's a good look at it. Go ahead with a hit the go button. There's, there's Plymouth Colony. That's where they're going to land. Uh, go ahead, hit the go button again. 
And so this is what's called Plymouth Plantation. It's an accurate, historically accurate uh, set of buildings, more or less uh, in the same sort of um, um, uh, what distribution or the same sort of layout as Plymouth Colony was. It's beautiful. Look at the, the beautiful Massachusetts Bay uh, on the upper part of the photograph. Go ahead. Here's one of the houses, and it's all, it was done authentically. Those are... Those are um, Boards that were uh, sawn and or split. And there's your thatch roof. Uh, let's go inside one of these spacious dwellings. There's mom's kitchen. And there she was with a kitchen in the corner. And then uh, if the cameraman were to turn around, he would see this. There's the other half of it. And there's your bed. They were going to come up with, they were supposed to build 19 of these before the winter. But because they had left so late in the season and took so long getting here, the Mayflower averaged a blazing pace of about four miles per hour. And when they finally actually disembark from the Mayflower, it was December the 21st. Anybody been in New England about December of that time? It was bitterly cold. And because they didn't have a dock, they had a smaller boat called the shallop. And so you would disembark the Mayflower, get onto the shallop, and the shallop would roll the, the distance and nudge up to the shore. But because they didn't have a very effective dock to get out of the shallop, you jumped into the water, and then you got wet uh, up to the hips. And so if you were on the construction crew, they were staying on the Mayflower, but uh, they were developing uh, um, a very strong disease and high fever. Doctors know today it was likely pneumonia. And in bitter cold through the end of December and into January, they begin to build. Instead of 19, they only finished seven in a common house. And when they just finished the common house, they were thanking God for that. And then an ember from the fireplace lit the roof on fire. Can you imagine that? And by this time, by the time you get to January and February, there's a pilgrim dying every day, sometimes two. Of the 102 pilgrims that came across, almost half of them perished. Let's go to the common house. I'll show you what that looks like. That was the common house that they built. This is supposedly uh, archaeologically uh, um, accurate. Um, it was a place where they could walk across the top, and if they needed to to defend themselves, they could all race from the seven dwellings and, and get there inside. During the, the height of the, the sick, sick season, when it was the, called it the season of dying, now you're into February. Snow very high on the ground. Every man that hadn't died was so ill that they could not rise out of bed. Not 20-year-old strapping John Alden and not the hardened soldier uh, Miles Standish either. It would seem that there were only two girls who were fit enough to go outside. And that was Priscilla Mullins and Desire Minter. And because they couldn't figure out why there weren't any Indians around, they didn't know, so they wanted to be sure. So Desire and Priscilla would put on a man's hat and then a man's coat and sling a musket over their shoulders and then they would walk across the top of that. Would you call that a rampart? I don't know, but it was the top and they would take their guns and they would you know, kind of march back and forth and then they would duck back in, change hat, change coat, change musket over the other shoulder and then they would march around again. On the odd chance that there might be somebody watching, yeah, they got dudes there when in fact they were all ailing, many of them hovering close to death. Pretty brave women, Priscilla Mullins and Desired Mentor. Go ahead, got some cool pictures. How beautiful is that? Amazing they had such high definition cameras back in 1620, isn't it? Pretty <laughs> awesome, pretty awesome indeed. These are actors, of course, and uh, the uh, Plymouth Plantation is a pretty fun place to go see. Go ahead. Uh, there's a stunt chicken. But that was, that's kind of close to the, to the layout. Uh, go ahead. Here's also something that they do. This is a Wampanoag uh, 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 relative. And so they also give a tour of 
kind of what the Wampanoags were doing. That was the main Indian clan there. And, of course, their chief was a guy by the name of Massasoit. Uh, go ahead, next, next slide. This is Squanto. Really, his entire name was Tisquantum. And he is a miracle of God. By the time March rolls around, mid to later March, the people that hadn't died were now sort of recovering. But there was a grim, grim realization they had eaten practically all of their grain. What were they going to plant for their crop, the crop for the next summer? And they had tried to fish the streams. They were unsuccessful. They had tried their hand at even planting some of the grain that they had brought with them, and they weren't doing well at all. They didn't understand which of the herbs around their their um, development were poisonous and which were good to eat. And so it was not looking good for the pilgrims. They, arrived, they left Southampton with 102, and now they're barely over 50. By the way, there were only two, or pardon me, there were only six adult women who had survived to this point. So in the third week of March, they hear from the ramparts of the common house, Indian! Miles Standish grabs his musket and the, the men who were able to grab their arms and they went to the head portion of the city where the walkway, or the little village where the walkway was and here came a beautiful man. He was, he was tall, dark-skinned as you might imagine, handsome and he was wearing in late March a loincloth and not much else. And so they're kind of looking at each other. This is one of the first Indians that they had seen. And he says to them, good morning. Do you have any, good morning, Englishmen. Do you have any beer? <laughs> and they're all, I'm sorry, what? They begin to talk and chat. And Samoset was that man's name. And so Samoset listened and what they were at and what was going on. He said, I think I know somebody who might be able to help you. So he said, I'll be back tomorrow with somebody. And so the next day, he came back with this man, to Squanto. Squanto is what he was known as. Squanto was a part of a tribe called the Patuxets. And they were curious with the pilgrims. Why hadn't they seen any Indians? Just a, just a very few, really, but really not very many at all. How come? When they first were sort of scouting out the region and decided to stay there at Plymouth, Plymouth they had found some kettles of corn hidden in the ground. Who put it there? They began to notice that many of the fields around Plymouth Colony had already been cleared of trees. Who did all that? And where were they? Squanto said, that was my people. And he told them a rather incredible story. Squanto said that six years in front, he had been lured aboard an uh, English vessel and had then been clasped in iron and then sold as a slave. He was sold to one person and then another person. Then he ended up with some clergymen. And they taught him English and some other languages. And he was such a good and diligent worker that he was able to actually purchase his freedom. And he was hired by another fella to be a guide back in this part of the region. His hometown. So he signed up for that excursion. He lands on the shore. They are attacked by some other Native Americans. Squanto escapes. Most of the crew he'd come over with did not survive the encounter. He made his way back to his homeland and found that six years later, they had all died, every one of them. His mom, his dad, his siblings... Anybody he had ever known six years ago was gone. Likely because of measles or smallpox. Here's one of, here's one of the other startling elements of the, the uh, pilgrim story. If they would have landed practically any other location on the East Coast, they would have encountered significant Native American response. And remember, can you blame the Native Americans? They were a bit twitchy when it came to the Europeans. 
There was only one place where there were no real sort of um, original inhabitants of the land. It was within Massachusetts Bay, and it was the area that they happened to land upon, Plymouth. Squanto was the last of the Patuxets, as far as he knew. Samuel said in Squanto then, uh, they made their introductions, had some fun talking back and forth. Again, the Puritans, the pilgrims were quite astounded that Squanto spoke pretty good English. So as uh, Samuel said in Squanto walk away, they were laughing. Not, we don't know for sure, but probably. Can you believe the, the condition of these Europeans, these white people? They're not going to make it. There's no way. Squanto says, I have no family. I have nothing. I think I can help them. So he starts to hang out with the pilgrims. He's the one that shows them how to fish which river at what time. When the tasty eels are running in their sort of migratory path, um, uh, season. And before you turn your nose up at ooh eels, evidently if it's prepared right, it's quite delicious. He showed them how to trap the, uh, the native turkey. And you think, well, well, that wouldn't be too hard because you're thinking of a kind of an American turkey that's like a big boat and barely can waddle. The New England turkey of this age could run 25 miles per hour. Show them how to trap the deer. How to, probably the greatest thing that Squano taught them was how to trap beaver. And beaver pelts became one of the main exports of the Plymouth colony for the next several years. He showed them the classic, uh, the reason you're not, you're not getting anything on the ground is the ground needs a kind of a nourishment or a food. We would call it fertilizer, of course. This ground in and of itself doesn't support agriculture very well, unless you do this. You rake back some of your, uh, your topsoil, you put your grains in there, and then you get some fish that you've caught with your nets, and he showed them how to do that, the little mullet fish. And then you put them nose together like a spokes of a wheel, and then you cover them over, all pointing at those kernels. But you got to watch out because the wolves will, will, of course, smell out the fish and dig it up. So you got to keep track of it for a couple of days until they decompose. That's how you're going to get your corn. Without Squanto, they would not have made it. All right. They finally move entirely off of the Mayflower, not until January. Then Samuel said in Squanto, so then because of that, they have a, a tremendous spring, a series of bumper crops, uh, not just corn, but other grains as well. And then by the time you get to uh, late November, early December, the pilgrims were very, very very thankful to the Lord their God for Squanto. They had met the great king Massasoit, and he was a little leery, of course, at first, but they became pretty good allies. They signed a treaty. And all things being the same, by the time uh, the crops were in and the harvests were completed, they looked at their storehouses and they said, I think we have enough for winter and to plant the next year. Now that we know which herbs, which fish, which streams, and they were becoming acclimated to the whole area, they finally had the sparkle of hope that maybe they could do this thing. Well, that, of course, will prompt the, it's not the first Thanksgiving, but it's really one of the Thanksgivings that should mark quite a place in our American culture. Go ahead to our next slide. This is that beautiful painting. This is by Jenny Augusta Brownscombe. She painted this in 1914. This hangs at the Plymouth Hall Museum there in Plymouth. Beautiful painting. Beautiful painting. And this is a kind of commemorating that first Thanksgiving. I'm going to read you a little bit right out of Bradford's uh, own history. Here's what he says. That summer of 1621 was beautiful. Much work went into the building of the new dwellings. Ten men were sent north up to the coast in the sailing shallop to conduct trade with the Indians. Squanto once again acted as their guide and interpreter. It was a successful trip, and that fall's harvest provided more than enough corn to see them through their second winter. 
The pilgrims were brimming over with gratitude, not only to Squanto and the Wampanoags, who had been so friendly, but to their God. In him they had trusted, and he had honored their obedience beyond their dreams. So Governor Bradford declared a day of public thanksgiving. To be held October, to be held in October, Massasoit was invited and unexpectedly arrived a day early with 90 Indians. Yeah. Counting their numbers, the pilgrims had to pray hard to keep from giving in to despair. To feed such a crowd would cut deeply into the food supply that was supposed to get them through the winter. But if they had learned one thing through their travails, this is what the author now, this is Peter Marshall and David Manuel, the light and the glory. If you ever want to read something about how America really got started, this is one. Um, Peter Marshall, and uh, I think is in, is, uh, can trace his background, I think, to, to one of the occupants of the Mayfire. I may be mistaken on that. But he is a pastor, and the two of them got together, and they went to original source materials for the writing of this book. And you're going to be absolutely surprised about some of what you were taught was not accurate at all. The unfortunate notion, I suppose, is most of our kids aren't learning any of this stuff now. But I can remember, remember in grade school, you, 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 you made big buckles for your shoes, and you made those hats? You made the turkeys by your hand, tracing your hand, your thumb was the gobble gobble and the feathers. Most of our teachers don't teach this stuff anymore. Why is, why is Plymouth Plantation so important, everyone? 1620 is when the pilgrims landed. About 10 years later, in 1630, uh, Jonathan Winthrop is leading uh, a group of uh, some four ships. And within that summer, there'll be 17 ships. They're going to land at, at uh, Massachusetts Bay, but not at Plymouth Colony, a little bit north. And they're going to found what will eventually become Boston. So, well, see, the Puritans really did put a foothold on that portion of the country. Now, the merchandising, uh, a lot of people, of course, uh, would later develop New York for a number of good reasons. The excellent harbor, the confluence of two um, really important rivers, and what have you. But make no mistake that the theological underpinnings of the first hundred years of this United States were formed by the Puritans. In the 1730s and the 1740s, you have what many scholars refer to now as the first great awakening. Jonathan Edwards, the sinners in the hands of an angry God. There was a powerful move of the Lord. Well, see, the millennials, so to speak, that were kind of the 1630s and 40s, the millennials of those, uh, that, those days eventually would then sire the children that would be millennials during the first great awakening. Well, what does that mean? Well, those millennials in the 1730s and 40s would eventually mature and occupy governmental seats of great influence. They were millennials during the first great awakening that had its roots in the teachings of the Puritans. By the time 1776 rolls around and they pin those 20 plus items of why it is a biblical mandate to, dis, to disengage with King George III and his impossible politics. I don't want to go too far afield, but the, the um, Puritans there now are in Boston and even in New York and, and, and some other places, Maine, Rhode Island and Delaware, they were never allowed to teach the Bible to either the Native Americans or by that time the slaves. The abolitionist parties of America were outlawed by King George III and the Americans were never allowed to print a Bible in and of themselves. After all, you can't be trusted. The Church of England guys have to do that. The millennials, when the Massachusetts Bay Colony and Jonathan Winthrop get started, they're going to be the adults and sire the kids that will be saved in the first great awakening. The millennials of the first great awakening are going to become the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. The 20 plus items detailed, we have a copy of it out in our lobby, were preached in the pulpits of New England well before it made the document that 56 founders signed. It's all connected. 
And the ideologies and the, the understanding that the Bible is God's word and a number of other issues started in many respects on this little Thanksgiving celebration there and you can see the, the Massachusetts Bay behind them. How this country got started ideologically as well as religiously, make no mistake, it was forged in the tween decks of a 66-day voyage. Why are you doing this? It was solidified by the survivors who saw loved ones, husbands and wives and sons and daughters buried in the snow in a little cemetery that they call Cemetery Hill now. Harvested, we understand that following the Lord, I mean really following the Lord, is going to cost. Think of what they did. To get away from the megachurch, if you will, if that's the right description, the megachurches of their day. Why do you want to go through all of that terrible hardship? Why in the world would you settle for such awful conditions when it's a lot easier to do it our way? He said, no. Nope. Back to this, this day. So 90 of his braves, but if they had learned one thing through their travails, it was to trust God implicitly. As, as it turned out, the Indians were not arriving empty-handed. Massasoit had commanded his braves to hunt for the occasion, and they arrived with no less than five dressed deer and more than a dozen fat wild turkeys and they help with the preparations, teaching the pilgrim women how to make hoe cakes and a tasty pudding out of cornmeal and something new that they did not even knew existed, didn't know that it existed not far from their, from their camp. Maple trees, maple syrup. Finally, they showed them an Indian delicacy, how to roast cor corn kernels in an earthen pop Heated to the right temperature, they would pop into fluffy white popcorn. And I know if you get on Wikipedia, they didn't do that. Read Bradford's book. It's amazing the people that weren't there have this, this idea that they know better than the people that were actually there. Back to the uh, narrative. The pilgrims, in turn, provided many vegetables from their household gardens, carrots and onions and turnips and parsnips and cucumbers, radishes, beets and cabbages. Also using some of their precious flour, they took summer fruits, which the Indians had dried, and introduced them to their likes of blueberry, apple, and cherry pies. It was all washed down with a sweet wine made from the wild grapes, that um, Squanto had shown them how to harvest. A joyous occasion for all. Between the meals, the pilgrims and Indians happily competed in shooting contests with gun and bow. The Indians were especially delighted that John Alden and some of the younger men of the plantation were eager to join them in foot races and wrestling. There were even military drills staged by Captain Standish. Things went so well, and Massasoit showed no inclination to leave. Who wants to leave a good party like this? That Thanksgiving Day was extended for three whole days. Surely one moment stood out in the pilgrim's memory, William Brewster's prayer. As they began the festival, they had so much which, to which, for which to thank God for providing all of their needs, even when their faith had not been up to believing that he would do so for the lives of the departed and for taking them home to be with him for their friendship with the Indians. So extraordinary when settlers to the south, there's your Jamestown, the south of them had experienced the opposite for all his remarkable providences in bringing them to this place and sustaining them. I'm going to show you one more thing. Go ahead. This is a portion of, um, Oh, that background was supposed, to, was supposed to be a lot darker. Well, hopefully you can pick it out or read it for you. This was issued by the Second Continental Congress, November the 1st, 1777. That should ring a bell. Yeah, isn't that about a month after the Battle of Saratoga? 
if you can kind of remember, I mean, you've got to blow the dust off of your history. It was the Battle of Saratoga that turned the tide of the war. The idea is that was the first major skirmish that General Washington and his generals had pulled off for a win. Why is it important? It was the first time a large contingency of the British soldiers were captured. And it showed the rest of the world, especially France, I think maybe they might have a chance. And after the Battle of Saratoga, France and a couple other countries reached out with loans and weaponry. The Battle of Saratoga was a huge turning of the terrible tide of defeat of the American Revolutionary War. It lasted eight years. So about um, a year or so uh, after 1776, a month after the Battle of Saratoga, what did the U.S. Continental Congress do? They said, let's have a federal, let's have a nationwide Thanksgiving. It's the first um, colonies governmental system saying it's time for all of us to unite in thanksgiving you mean for our microwave ovens and our 80 inch plasma screen tvs listen to this remember this is a month after saratoga i'll read it it is therefore recommended to the legislative or the executive powers of these united states to set apart thursday the 18th day of december next for solemn thanksgiving and praise. What do you mean solemn? Are we supposed to be having fun? Are we supposed to be getting loose on liquor? Not the first one. There, a, there is a solemn thanksgiving. What? In appreciation for something. Not just, gee, thank you, Lord, for the food, and thank you, Lord, that we live in a great country, which is always a good prayer. But they knew that if it wasn't for the Battle of Saratoga, things would look gravely different. Solemn thanksgiving and praise, that at one time with one voice the good people may express the grateful feelings of their hearts and consecrate themselves. Isn't thanksgiving just to thank God and then just watch football and, get, and wear your expando pants, you know? No, the very first thanksgiving, both for the pilgrims and this first national thanksgiving, was, was, was a consecration, a rededication of one's life and passion to the living God. And to consecrate themselves to the service of the divine benefactor. Go ahead. And that, together with their sincere acknowledgments and offerings, they may join the penitent confession. Wait a minute. I thought Thanksgiving was drinking and getting crazy. Well, for some, not for these, Pentated confession of their manifold sins. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought we had ourselves a separation of church and state here. Didn't the founding fathers, weren't they really serious about keeping church and state apart? If anyone does the slightest bit of study, you're going to see and run across documents like this. It gets better. Penitent confession for their manifold sins, whereby they have forfeited every favor. And their humble and earnest supplication that it may please God through the merits of, say it with me please, Jesus Christ. This is one of the very first federal documents. You have to be careful you say federal because the federalist paper people will get upset with you. But the very first supranational or supra state, if you will, government, fresh off the victory of Saratoga, they knew where their victory came from, not their military might, because they didn't have that much. Not from their military expertise and prowess. They knew into every fiber of their being that it was the manifold blessing of God to give it to them. And they called this day of thanksgiving to thank the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are people that still believe that the founding fathers... How many founding fathers were, uh, were uh, in this, this whole uh, Second Continental Congress? It's the same Second Continental Congress that drafted the Declaration. Yeah, all 56 of those fellows are here. And of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 29 of them had advanced theological degrees. You see it right there, don't you? Merits of Jesus Christ. 
If anyone ever tries to tell you, uh uh-uh, the founding fathers wanted a separation of church and state in your face. (laughs) Through the merits of Jesus Christ, mercifully to forgive and blot them out of remembrance, that it may please him graciously to afford the blessings on the governments of these states, respectively. Have fun on Thanksgiving. Amen? Amen. May the Lord give you great wisdom. Be careful. Over 600 new cases of COVID reported today in Washoe County. Harvest, be careful. Be wise. Let's all stand together. Lord, I want to thank you for studies like this. And if anyone who wants and is serious about getting to the bottom, the whole issue of the separation of church and state reveals itself for the grandest intellectual atrocity and stupidity of all time. It's fascinating to me that there are still highly educated people that espouse this stupid notion. Father, I want to thank you for America and most of us in this room, Lord, we realize the tremendous blessings that are afforded to us. We're given to complain very often. That's kind of how many humans are wired. But Father, we want to take this moment, those of us in this room tonight, and Father, Holy, Holy, Holy One of Israel, Jehovah God, the Hashem, the Adonai. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for brave men and women like these pilgrims. Father, it is time for me, I believe, to stop living my life and my Christianity so that it pleases me. We've seen a rather glaring example of a group of people who laid it all on the line and what you did with it, and the supernatural resources you poured into it. Oh, if there's one man or one woman totally given to the Lord Jesus Christ and his word, it is so powerful. I suppose that's why the enemy comes against it with such ferocity. And it's probably a reason why there's not very many of them. And Lord, I think the conditions are not too terribly different. I think, Lord God, that most people are happy to stay with what most Christians are doing and having, frankly, a whole lot more fun. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, make me a prayer warrior that the fasts and prays. We've been looking at your gospels closely, and the ministry is not nearly what we thought. The ministry is that the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk, the dead will rise. And the gospel is preached to the poor. It's really that simple. I pray in Jesus' name, help harvest to become people who are not so consumed with consuming. Help us to be people, Lord. I think of the six adult women who prepared much of that feast because the rest of the adult women had perished. Lord, I can't get the story out of my mind, I heard. In tears, the ER nurse was coming off one of several 12-hour shifts in a row, exhausted to the bone. She had weathered the first wave last spring and then July wave and now in her city, here, came the biggest, here comes the biggest wave of all. Weeping, fighting back tears, she was finally able to gather her breath and say to the interviewer, when I was coming home off my last 12-hour shift, having seen too many people die, I drove past a packed bar and restaurant. Few of them were wearing masks. I wanted to shout. Stop being so selfish. It 
hasn't touched your life. That's why you can freely do these foolish behaviors because you're counting on people like me to pick up the pieces. We are exhausted. And too many are quitting. Harvest America is consumed with consuming. And Lord, this whole COVID thing has really brought that into stark relief. In Jesus' name, Lord, may we at Harvest wear our masks and stay socially distanced and come under the authority of the governor that you have given us. And that in Jesus' name, Lord God, we pray for those who are putting out such effort on our behalf and we pray for, for this nation so selfish that it can't see the dying. Oh, I pray in Jesus' name. That's a heart condition. That's not a political distinction. Masks or no masks. In Jesus' name, may we be different. And everybody said, amen. 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 Okay, thank you, Lord. If you have some prayer, come up. And we'd love to pray with you. And we'll see you on Tuesday. No, Sunday.